All right, everyone, let's go for round two. Uh, thanks for your patience on these technical difficulties. Goes with the, go, goes with the uh, nature of connecting virtually in this day and age. But Andrew, thank you very much for your patience as we smoothed it all over. Um, I was just in the midst of asking you about, um, let's just get right to it in terms of Jonathan Larson and Tick, Tick, Boom. I was just in the midst of asking you about the pressure that he feels as an artist to find success before the age of 30. And yeah. I'm curious if you could relate at all to a similar self-imposed deadline. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure if it's if I have a similar self-imposed deadline. I think as a young artist, as a young actor, at first I just wanted to make sure I could put food on the table and shelter over my head. And I remember my, one of my first gigs was a, a, a Doritos commercial in Spain and I got paid like two thousand pounds for two days of work and i thought well if i can just do this for the rest of my life i will be deeply satisfied and really really happy and you know so at first it was just that it was like do i get to do what i love and make a living off of it mm -hmm. um and i would i would have done anything you know what i mean like i and you know so so then yeah i mean it, i think the difference with john is that well, I think the universal thing about John, I think this is why so many younger actors, well, no, all actors and artists respond to this film, is this sense of destiny, the sense of calling, the sense of vocation that we all have to feel in order to take on this very silly, um, kind of vulnerable, um, most likely poverty-stricken life um, because of this sense of calling this uh, sense of yearning to be a part of something that's bigger than us and a very, very specific artistic calling. So um, I, I know that John obviously and evidently felt that, but the difference with John is that I, I from my understanding, this is from having played him and done all my research and my own impressions and my own interpretation and the whole point of that title tick tick boom and the fact that there was a line in the original tick tick boom that he wrote that had to be cut after his very tragic and untimely death at such a young age and the line was sometimes i feel like my heart is going to explode and and as we all know he 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 died of an aortic aneurysm of a heart attack but by different words at such a young age so i think unconsciously and this is something that kind of hits me in a profound way is that unconsciously he knew that somewhere deep down he didn't have a lot of time he genuinely didn't and yes he was surrounded by his community of people that were struck suffering and and in lots of cases dying during the aids epidemic so that was obviously making this deep indelible impression upon him and his psyche and his awareness of the shortness and sacredness of life but also i think there was something else happening which is the ticking to me the ticking and and, and i think of course you can't know that you can't consciously know oh, i'm going to die at this age and i'm going to but i think the ticking is emanating from this deep deep place and i think he spends the show the film trying to figure out what is this ticking so 30 90 is well it's just i'm turning 30 and my girlfriend's biological clock is ticking and i i i Sondheim did this by the time he was this age and john lennon did this by the time he was that age and my parents did this and so so it must just be that but then he, fig he thinks he figures it out, but the ticking remains and it's, it feels more profound than that. It feels more profound than a benchmark or a kind of, um, you know, a kind of, you know, uh, you know, a, a mandatory place that you get to before a certain age. Um, but yes, I mean, I, I, and I think there's something, there's something beautiful about living in that way for all of us. And, and again, as I said earlier, I don't know if you caught it, but in our twenties, we do have this need to make our mark to put our flag in the ground and say i'm here i'm alive i matter and this is what i want to do this is what i want to give to the world mm -hmm. and this is how i want to express myself in the world and i want to be a part of you know in john's case obviously and i think in all of our cases that that work in 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 theater and film industry is we want to be a part of as tony kushner put it in angels in america keeping the world spinning forwards, mm -hmm. which is the, the only direction that it must spin. Um, and it's a very, very, you know, it's a crazy day to be 
thinking about that because obviously what's happening um on the other side of the world but um anyway so yeah that's yeah. that's my yeah. long-winded answer to no, a, I mean, a we'll question. take long-winded any day of the week um but but kind of thinking about that you're you're reminiscing on the fact that especially people in their 20s artists in their 20s um kind of feel this this need to leave their mark we did some math real quick over at backstage just to see where you were at at this point in your life and it was actually how did you do that <laughs> well wrapping the filming of amazing spider-man 2 you were just two months shy of turning 30 yourself and I i'm curious if your experience with grappling with success within that franchise or your idea of success if you could relate that to jonathan and kind of the period that he was at at this time you know what that the, that's so interesting no i the, the the period that I relate to with Jonathan is the period after my Doritos fame, mm. my Spanish language Doritos fame, and, a, and, I, and I did two plays in the UK, and I thought, well, I'm good for the rest of my life. The work is just going to keep coming in, and I'm going to keep being able to do this. And then I had a period of a year and a half of 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 not getting any any you know not not booking any of my auditions and and taking on five different odd jobs, and I was you know a waiter, a, a, a bar back, I. I did telemarketing, which is the the hell, um, or maybe purgatory. I'm not sure. Um, I did. I was a, I was at Starbucks. I was a barista at Starbucks. I was one of my favorites, actually. And um, there was one. I was a cricket coach. And for those of you who you know in America, cricket is baseball, but longer and more boring. Um, uh, so yeah, five five jobs, one and a half years. And it was in that period of time that I had my kind of tick, tick, boom, Jonathan yeah. Larson, the world mm -hmm. doesn't want me. The world doesn't want my gifts. I, I have to figure out if this is sustainable, if I can keep banging my head against the wall, longing for something that I don't know if, you know, if the, if the agony of that was too much. And I kept on rereading and rereading Raina Maria Rilke's um, letters to a young poet which I would advise any, you know, any young artist to go and read because it's basically a call to arms um, for, 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 for us to, to, to in the, if in the middle of the night, we, we can't help the thought I must write, or I must act, I must tell stories, I must direct, I must paint, whatever it is, then, then we have no choice, but to do it. Otherwise a part of us will die. A very, very important part of our souls will die. So I thankfully in the, you know, in, in the, in all the stock rooms of those jobs I was working at kind of weeping gently over you know the, the me feeling like i was out of alignment with what I, what I was supposed to be doing that voice came and it kept on knocking and it kept on saying just hang in hang in so that was really the, that, that period of time and you know the, the 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 what i find remarkable about john is that he never saw you know quote unquote external success the external validation he got great mentorship from people like sondheim from and support from his community and his friends but he never got the world telling him, Hey, we want you to do what you're doing. We need it actually. And, 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 and I obviously am someone who has received that in, in, in lots of different ways through my career. And I, I'm so humbled by it that I get encouragement from my peers and from audiences. And I, and I don't take it lightly in any way, shape or form. But what I find so moving is that Jonathan woke up every morning to failure, rejection letters, um, poverty and continued to paint continued to play music um in in the hope in the kind of almost hopeless hope that that one day people would be ready to listen and i find that and and, he, and again the, the the terrible tragic moving part is that he never got to receive that harvest he never got to receive the tony and the pulitzer and see audiences respond because he died on the the night before the first preview of rent off broadway he never got to see an audience take in his work in that way and yeah. and I, and yet he still did it every day he woke up in the face of all that and still put pen to paper i i i he's a far greater example than than i could ever hope to be and it, it's interesting because obviously at that stage in anyone's career especially an artist you're going to be facing down uh, rejections and imposter syndrome, but even when you're at the stage where you're at, you're, you're finding ways to challenge yourself. I mean, Angels in America, I imagine, was a gargantuan challenge, and you've even spoken about facing imposter syndrome with Tick Tick Boom in terms of learning to trust your instrument while alongside these musical theater luminaries. So what, what do you do today when that imposter syndrome comes sneaking in? 
it's an old friend at this point and it, it, it happened it comes every single time and i think i'm so grateful that i've hung in my work long enough i've been working now for 18 years as an actor and that's shocking um and and yet i'm so grateful because now literally every time i go to work that that part of me will just kind of like slowly emerge from the deep waters of my unconscious like a sea monster and is just ready to 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 remind me how how i should give up and how i have nothing to offer and how i'm empty inside and how dare you even try you're going to embarrass yourself and you that they, they'll find you out you'll never work again and you'll never be able to go out in public you know it gets extreme um and it's every time yeah and and it feels like there's no, I, I tried to extract it from my process, but it's maybe the most important part to know that I'm going to go through that every time. And, and to, and I remember in the, in the rehearsals for, for Angel, Angels in America and when we were in London at the National Theatre and Tony Kushner, my wonderful friend and mentor, genius writer that, that he is, he, he came and he asked me to do the play, you know, and, and then he came in week three of rehearsals to see a run through of the first half of play one. And I thought, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm exploring still. I'm going to see what happens. And we did the run through and he couldn't look me in the eye after the, um, the, the, the run through. And I interpreted that as, you know, the sea monster was interpreting it. The sea monster was like, he knows <laughs> you better, you better. And I went for lunch and walked on the South bank of the, of, of London. And I was like, how do I, my, the sea monster was saying, you know, throw yourself in the river, break a leg rather than go back into rehearsal. And I was, and I just, I had to kind of put my arm around the little terrified little sea monster. And I said, I look, I know you feel vulnerable. I know, I know this is scary. And I know Tony Krishnan may hate us. He may not, we, it may be our projection, maybe. Um, but I think we just, I think I'd, I think rather than throw myself in the Thames, I think I'll just go back to rehearsal and just feel really embarrassed and try again and be vulnerable again and just try again. And, and that's kind of it. That's kind of, you just have to get back in the room and it really is as simple as that. And it can be a fuel, you know, it can be a tailwind, that kind of fear, that kind of terror, it makes you work 20 times harder and it leaves no stone unturned. Because when you there's nothing worse than stepping on stage feeling naked feeling naked in, in the wrong way. I think we want to feel naked in the right way. Feeling naked in the right way, feeling alive, feeling vulnerable to an audience, feeling like you're making it spontaneously, um, especially on stage and on film, as you go. That kind of nakedness feels really important um, mm -hmm. to, to risk, to not have it all figured out and planned out, but to allow life to happen for an audience feels like the most um, the most important thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and whether you're on stage or screen, um, I, well, I'd love to dig a bit into kind of your, your acting process, as it were, whether it's something like Angels, whether it's something like Jonathan or even Peter Parker. Um, if you were to break down the, the pillars of the Andrew Garfield technique, how do you kind of begin with a new role? What, what are the steps to you kind of putting that into practice? Sure. Well, it's, it's different every time. But the one thing that remains is once you have it once i have a role that i want and that i'm excited for there's a period of maybe 24 hours where i really enjoy myself because after 24 hours i have to actually start working on it and then i have to reckon with this with the with the deep sea monster and all the rest all the rest of the voices that live in my head um so so yeah and it, and it always feels like the first day of school every single time and no character has has been the same process for me. So for instance, with Tick, Tick, Boom, the process was, it was funny because I was so consciously focused on the skill set that I, I didn't start the process with, which was um, singing and piano and choreography, dance choreography. Those three things were so big in my consciousness that I think maybe my acting process became much more, um, uh, it, it was left, it was, there, I wasn't interfering with it too much because my, my ego terror was, was occupied with these things that I could really apply myself to and go to singing lessons every day and go to piano lessons every day and go to, you know, do, do learn choreography with Ryan Heffington every day. And so then my acting process became a bit, it was freer. 
it was more um tr i was trusting of myself more i wasn't yeah. interfering so much you know in that way and and i and and i think with that researching john and and combining my imagination with john's and finding my psyche in john's and his in mine and meeting friends of his and that all became just incredibly pleasurable which naturally of course it is to become a student in the life of jonathan larson and become a devotee of this incredible example of what it is to be a young artist and um and also a, a genius writer a, a completely genius creator to get into the psyche of that you know wild willy wonka pure imagination of his that that all became just very pleasurable and i, I wasn't blocking anything mm -hmm. um so by the time that I, but all, ultimately the aim always is to by the by the time I arrive on set or or, or at first preview, is that I I get out of the way and I trust the work that I've done and I allow the character to kind of have its own life and to not interfere, not manage, not control too much, but actually to follow impulses. And with John, it was easier than ever to allow his impulses to lead. I think because of the magic of the space that Lin-Manuel Miranda set up, but also because of the, the depth of the dive I went into and me falling in love with John, just me, me finding a long lost brother in him and feeling a real genuine spooky connection to him as a man, as a, as an artist, as, um, you know, a theater, a, a person of the theater. Um, and, and, and so that's always the intention. And so that you can be spontaneous and, and alive and really, really play with your fellow actors. But there's a lot of weird stuff that I do that I would never ever share with anyone else. <laughs> like I do a lot of weird ritual stuff and dream work and like um, lots of unlocking unconscious, you know, archetypal kind of images in the psyche and, you know, personal, like I do lots, you know, it's, it's hard. It's like, um, you know, everything has to be personal. I have to make every choice feel like it's me so that I'm not doing any acting, I suppose. But that's that's where that's where I'm always aiming. And I always do very, very different things to get there. You know, I'll use animal study for characterization. Sometimes I'll use um, the Laban efforts for physicality and rhythm. I'll, I'll do voice work with my great um, dialect coach and and but also with John, everything was so cohesive. Like it wasn't a mu he wasn't in a musical. He was just in his life, <laughs> and singing and playing for him was just as natural as breathing in and out. Yeah. Um, so 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 that that felt helpful as well. To, to it, it was just a it, part of his characterization was his need to express at an eleven all the time through right, through right. Dance, through singing through music, not just through you know talking. And and it kind of is like the the life of an artist in a way, not not to get glib about it, but I, I, I do love that. I mean, you, you've spoken of it before and I'd love just to pick your brain a bit more on it, but the idea of seeing things through the lens of an actor always. So you, you'll be experiencing something as Andrew, but then also unconsciously breaking it down and feeling how your body responds, seeing how you feel just in case you need to reenact that moment as a performer. So is your, is your actor's brain always on kind of? Yeah, I, I, <laughs> yeah, yes. Even in my sleep, like I have a very active sleep life. I'm told, um, because I wake up thinking I'm very, very rested, and I, and I get informed that um, I was, you know, fending off a lion, and I had tied a t-shirt around my head, and I had a, a lamp in my hand like a spear, and I was hiding in the closet, or you know, whatever. Like I, there's, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty wild in there. Um, but, 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 but also, yeah, I think it's impossible to avoid once you start, you know, falling into the craft of something that you love, where everything is framed by that perception. And, you know, I think about some, it was a great example. I, I mean, you know, in, in the, in our film, that moment where, and, and when Lynn showed this moment to a bunch of his writer friends, cause it's the same thing for a writer in, in a, in a different way. Um, they 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 all cringed and they crumpled and they said lynn you can't show them that that moment in the middle of the therapy sequence where you th where 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 alex's character and my character are just getting back to maybe figuring it out like realizing that there's just been crossed wires and there's an embrace and there's a kiss and then john a melody starts to come to john for therapy for that song therapy and you see him kind of looking off into his 
imagine a imaginal realm in in a, in the realm of his imagination and then kind of doing a, a piano a little piano flurry on his fingers and she 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 catches him and it's 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 so brutal because it's so true um because this is the kind of the the curse and the gift of loving what we get to do in our lives um that it does become consuming and that sometimes just like we have to have boundaries with people we have to somehow have sometimes maybe if we can have boundaries with you know the creative muse or the kind of the calling the vocation i know i i know i find it very very difficult just to set boundaries when the muse strikes or when i you know yeah for instance i think i told this story before but i was after a night a night a week of work on angels in america i, I found myself at home choking on a piece of steak while an M NBA game was on and I was, it was the playoffs and I, I was just so upset. And I, I, and I remember going into my toilet at the time and there were three different levels of consciousness that were happening. One was, oh my God, that steak is so good. And the basketball game is so exciting. This is so unfair that I'm choking on a steak in this moment. And the second level of consciousness was, was, oh God, I actually think this is a, like a, like a death choke. Like, I think this is what happens because I couldn't, I could barely get ox. There was like a little gap. So it was like, a, I was like, Ooh, I don't know if it, Oh, this might be death. This might be death. And I started to panic. And I, and then the third level of consciousness was remember everything you're doing, all the different physical sensations, <laughs> remember the behavior, because one day you'll be choking in a thing. You got to recreate it. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, I don't know what the right word is, but it's it's definitely it's unhinged. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of unhingedness that I think an obsession that we have, and I don't know. I just find it. I I'm I'm so glad that I found something that I'm obsessed with. Like I think it's a rare thing to find. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And you and you're certainly speaking our language here at backstage, kind of getting into the weeds of it all. Um, I, I am curious, looking to uh, obviously your other huge performance this year was as Peter Parker. What what are the overlaps in character preparation for a role in the MCU that might take us by surprise compared to Martin Scorsese's Silence or Angels in America or any of the roles that are more capital A acting? Um, <laughs> but what, what are the overlaps that might surprise us? That's so interesting because when I first played Peter Parker in Spider-Man when I was in my 20s, I did treat it like Hamlet. Like it, it was... <laughs> It was Scorsese's Hamlet, Peter Parker, Spider-Man. Like that's how I was approaching it, you know. Okay, well, you know, I've lost my parents. I'm an orphan. I'm, you know, it's like that. If you're gonna if you're gonna really step into that in a real way, like that's that's heavy psychological, emotional stuff. And I and I and for me it was like, you know, there's lots of young men that young boys that are gonna be watching this and I wanted to offer something that had soul. I wanted to offer something that felt um, felt real and relatable and complicated and not um, you know fun and joyful as well. But also, I wanted to honor what it is to be an orphaned teenager. I wanted to really dive into that and the what it what it would, what it would do to the heart of a person and 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 trust with people and all those things. Um, so that may be surprising but then with this go around because the pressure was off of me it was really on the brilliant tom holland playing um playing peter parker for me i had a very different intention going into this one my intention was to have a lot of fun and to be of service really to be and toby and myself had the same feeling we were just like we want to enjoy ourselves if we're going to do this and we want to just really make sure we're serving the story and we're serving tom as peter um but in terms of preparation for that, there was lots of, we did lots of rewriting and improvising and playing and finding because there were so many different things that we could have been doing in those scenes. Like you, your imagination just goes like that. You look at something like the, the Spider-Verse movie and you go, wow, like the, what, what, the, the Lord and Miller movie. And you go, yeah, there's an exponential amount of options to, to explore with the multiverse and with how three Peter Parkers would interact. And so we really just played a lot and, took it really seriously, but really just let our imaginations just kind of go. But it was, to be honest, it was the most joyful time I've had on a set because the pressure was off. Um, and it was, there was a lightness. There was a real lightness to the experience. Um, but, but I would actually say the same thing about playing Jonathan and Tick, Tick, Boom. There was, there was more joy 
on that set than I'd ever experienced um, on a set before. I think a lot of that is obviously to do with John himself, the character and the, his world and this incredible group of musical theater, thoroughbred genius actors, but also maybe mostly Lynn because mm-hmm. Lynn is just this party. He's just, a, he's just, it's like doing a film with your seven year old best friend from, you know, primary school. And all he wants to do is talk about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the history of musical theater and rap music. And, uh, and then you shoot scenes and he, uh, he's just so excited that we're shooting scenes for a, a film about Jonathan Larson, you know, so it was, he was just so grateful every morning. I think it spread to the whole crew that we were all just kind of like, yeah, this is, and we were shooting a lot of it in the middle of the pandemic pre-vaccine. And we were the only live theater in town, you know, at the New York theater workshop where we got to shoot, um, you know, the, the one man show of tick, tick, boom, which we wouldn't have got to shoot there if we had shot it. Um, uh, if, if the pandemic hadn't have happened. Um, but we were the only actors doing live theater in town every day we were in that space. And that was humbling because the, the rest of our community were, we were, we were all sat yeah, doing, yeah, our, doing our duty, being being non-essential for that moment. Even though, I would argue that we are incredibly essential all the yes. time. You're in good company um, with that opinion. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, as a final question for you, you, you're mentioning this joy that you found on set with these two latest projects, and also the challenges that came along the way. You said mm. that uh, it's harder to find things to challenge you the further you get along in your career, just by nature, you're getting more experience under your belt. So um, in what ways are you looking to challenge yourself next? What, what are well, you- I, Yeah, it's a really good question. I remember, so I remember finishing Angels in America and going, oh gosh, I'm not, I'm still here. How did I, how did that happen? Um, because for all of us who know that play and that part, to do that as many shows a week that we did, you know, you kind of, you need a holiday and you need to rest and, you need to just lay down for a while, but, 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 and it's like, you kind of feel like the dead sea, like you've, like you've just given all, like all of yourself all over and over again. And it was the closest thing that I'll ever experience. I think to being like a monk, to being like, um, a, a kind of, um, uh, a monk artist actor, you know, just, I was, I was living de- devoted to Tony Kushner's angels in America for a good year and a half. And yeah, it was after that. And I thought, well, ah, man, I don't know. And then Lynn obviously was like, can you sing? And I said, no, I can't internally. And outside I said, yes, I I shall (laughs) to him. Um, So yeah, that was a wonderful thing. So yeah, I I don't know what the next challenge is, but um, I think I do need that. I do need to feel very vulnerable. I need to feel like I'm taking risks in this work. Um, uh, To feel alive and, and, and to feel like it will have life and to feel like it it's um it's it's not safe i i think i think as soon as i feel safe then maybe a little a little part of the work dies and it becomes less uh, less important less kinetic um but yeah i'm i'm very very cute definitely more theater like the, the, no matter what play you're doing you're going to be shit scared <laughs> so like if you're doing a 30 a 30 minute little skit you're going to you're going to you, you're going to want to run away so like theater will always be there to make me feel totally um you know uh you know just not not enough i will always feel not enough in the theater um so yeah but but in terms of characters and roles and other kind of things i mean i i i don't know right now i I definitely look at my fellow actors in tick tick boom and go how on earth do you do this eight times a week how do you how do you sing i was i saw my one of my best friends eddie redmayne doing cabaret in london when i was just there this this last weekend and I just bowed to him and, and backstage afterwards because what he's doing um, and what the whole cast is doing is is superhuman. It's superhuman what musical theater performers do. And what Eddie does in that particular show is transcendent. And um, so I have total reverence for musical theater, theater actors. So maybe one day I'll get to the place where my chops are up enough to be able to do eight shows a week.
Yeah, I mean, if Tick Tick Boom is any indication, I think uh, that that's just the next thing in line, right? We'll see. <laughs> I, I, I love that part of the part of the desire for challenge is also inviting the the sea monster in a little bit. You gotta. <laughs> but I make friends <laughs> with it. Raise yourself. Yeah, yeah. Make friends with it and take good care of it. Keep it fed and water. Otherwise, it will start eating you. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, Andrew, this has been such a pleasure. Thanks for sharing. Uh, some of your time with us and especially um, just to break down all the nitty gritty details that Backstage loves in terms of process and your latest projects. This has been such a pleasure. So For me too. Um, thank you so much. I love yeah. I love the, this conversation and, and everything you guys do. So thank you. And thanks everyone for coming. Thank you so yeah. much for coming. Sorry thanks about the other stuff. Again. I wish we had more time. Next time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.